just a quick run through. Um, what's your thoughts on the NBA right now? I mean, the thing, are you surprised with the teams that are on top? I think the NBA is in a state of flux, but there are refreshing things going on with young teams uh, doing well. Uh, you, you could see some of this coming. Uh, other things are surprises, but it's uh, it's it's ultimately good for the league. It's a sense of new blood, new stars being made. What's going on in OKC is certainly really interesting. Uh, the league is fascinated on its future in San Antonio, of course, with Wimby. And that is great. And, you know, young players have to make their way. Uh, OKC has suffered for a while, and th they have brought in talent, and that talent is now rising and doing things for them. Okay, we're talking about Wemby, but one one guy that has caught my attention is uh, Chet Holmgren. What can you say about this kid uh, after sitting out last year? Yeah, and it was tough. You know, his his season basically ended right away last year, and so he had to wait all this time. Every extremely tall player sort of faces the questions that Phil Jackson raised for them when the Knicks. You remember back in 2015, drafted Chris Stapp's Porzingis. And, of course, it can take long for an extremely tall player to find his way in the game. But we're seeing amazing things from extremely tall players. And given time and patience um, and obviously um, some mindfulness about the different physical challenges they face, Teams like the Boston Celtics are now suddenly reaping some of the benefits of Porzingis. Uh, questions will always remain on tall players because of the health issue. But, boy, they're doing amazing things. And so it's it's hard not to be excited because the dimensions of the game really are reaching heights that, you, you know, uh, I, I have a book out on Magic Johnson. He was the first – he shocked the world as this 6'9 point guard, but he opened the age for positionless basketball. And, you know, these tall players, they're not necessarily centers. They're, uh, they, they have so many skills that, you, you know, basketball for all of its early decades was mostly the domain of short athletic players. Uh, and there used to be a deep prejudice against tall players. Uh, one famous American college coach referred to them back in the early 40s as glandular goons. In other words, circus freaks. Well, they're not circus freaks. They are just amazing athletes mm -hmm. in terms of the NBA. But it is a unique thing. Hey, sir, you mentioned his name. We talked about him the last time we saw each other. Chris Porzingis, now he's injured again. Um, do you think this will hurt the Celtics? I mean, we all know that Porzingis has a history of injuries, and sometimes he misses a lot of the regular season games. Do you think this will be a factor? Well, yes and no. Um, you know, it's early enough in the season – uh, perhaps, where it won't be as big of a factor, but they did give up important pieces to get him. And uh, they were playing nicely. So, But, you know, they still have their two superstars. And they still have some role players that have really come into their own. So, I, I you know, I wouldn't close the door on the Celtics by any stretch. All right. I'm sure you heard of this. The Draymond Green issue. What what can you say about that choking incident? I mean, it's it maybe have been over and done with. Uh, Green's uh, served his suspension, but what are your thoughts on his actions and his antics? Well, it makes me think of Dennis Rodman with the Bulls, and Dennis Rodman, of course, came in and it, there was one controversy after another with Dennis, just with the way he played and the, but he was so unique and he did so many things to help drive those late '90s Bulls to those 
uh, three straight championships. Uh, and Dennis, of course, is in the Hall of Fame. When when these incidents happen, they stir up a lot of controversy because they're out of the norm. Choking somebody in an NBA game. But, you know, basketball from the very first years it was invented and it was played in YMCAs uh, pretty soon all over the world, but they noticed right away there were a lot of fights. Basketball is an emotional game. And players like Dennis Rodman, uh, our famous Mr. Green, they're emotional players. They bring a, a physical edge to things a lot of times. That's going to be controversial. Ultimately, Draymond Green will be a Hall of Famer. He will be viewed as a critical and unique player that 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 played obviously a major major role he was the enforcer he was a, a guy who moved the ball he obviously rebounded and defended and still does those things and so his place in basketball is secure along with the controversy that a player like that brings <laughs> okay so you don't think this is going to hurt the i mean last season they said the pool punching incident with Draymond Green hurt their chances. Do you see that happening again this season? Well, the same narrative with Dennis Rodman and the Bulls. He was doing this stuff. It had an impact. You know, he, he would take off and go gamble in Las Vegas as he did one time. And, you know, uh, I, I think the thing that matters is the Bulls had a core uh, built around Michael Jordan, and he was a determined, powerful, powerful figure in NBA competition, obviously. Well, guess what? The Golden State Warriors have their own version of that. Now, it is an aging team, and so you don't know how much longer all of this will hold together, but they brought everybody back for a reason because this is their shot but they have figured it out before and the NBA season is still young. And so we'll see where it leads. It's not pretty right now and it may not get any prettier. We don't know, but the formula is there and that's where their money is. And I would have been surprised if they had made changes right now. They had a formula. These guys could get hot. They can figure out things. We'll just have to see. I I don't know. But I understand why we're here. Uh, we've seen it before, as I said. And so we'll see where the Warriors go. People still are curious about them because when they are playing well, they play really well. True, true. true. Okay. Now, there's another player from the Chicago Bulls, Zach Levine. I mean, he's been linked to a lot of teams, especially the Lakers, who, but the Bulls are allegedly, well, according to Cham Champsarania, that they want Austin Reeves in the package. What do you think about that, sir? Well, you know, I think um, teams will evaluate the opportunity to get Zach Levine. You know, he's out again with foot issues right now. Um, that never helps, particularly for a player with some injury history. And so that is not going to drive his market up. That's going to probably drive it down a bit. But, you know, at least one in NBA general manager is saying, hey, here we are with a, uh, a player that um, at least will get a first-round pick in a trade. Might get two. I doubt it with his foot issues. But they're all, you know, the the math of the NBA and what various teams are are doing with their balance sheets, it always leads to some weird stuff. So you never know. But does he make sense for the Lakers? I mean, in your opinion, sir. No. I think they uh, have a healthy Austin Reeves. That They have other things to figure out. Uh, they've shown that they can do it with that roster, but you know, they're searching right now. And when you add lots of players, that's what you do. You search, 
You're trying to find chemistry, uh, identity. Everybody's got to fill roles. Those roles change when you bring in new players. And you have players who are um, showing promise, but they still haven't totally defined themselves. And I think that's some of the Lakers' issues. Uh, obviously, when you have those issues, it brings questions about coaching. Uh, but, but I think um, – they have, again, uh, you come back to a core that it's hard to beat. LeBron James is a central, powerful figure in your organization. And so that means you have a chance to put things together down the stretch, as as the Lakers did for that uh, nice playoff run last season. I don't see them trading Austin Reeves in that deal. I could be wrong. There could be other things at play, but I just don't see it. How about uh, D'Angelo Russell and Rui Hachimura? I mean, their names were also mentioned. Uh, it could be, you know, um, today's basketball, these executives shuffle their rosters like a deck of cards. They're, they're, they're like gamblers in one regard, shuffling and reshuffling the deck, hoping they deal up with some chemistry that will take them somewhere. Uh, you know, um, at times the best general managers are also incredibly patient. A lot of it is going to depend on what LeBron James reads in this situation as much as any general manager. And it's going to depend on what he wants around him and what, what he thinks. You know, players like LeBron James, we're in the age of tremendous player power. And, and LeBron, is, you know, he, he has – been in favor of some moves that didn't work for the later, uh, Lakers, Russell Westbrook. Uh, and so, he, you know, when players have all this power, they're just like executives. They they have to learn the limits of that power. And it's it, it, it's not some set picture. It's, it's always fairly complex, but it's part of what makes uh, basketball, this five-man sport, it's part of what makes it so interesting to fans. Okay. Well, how about, sir, I mean, let's talk about the losing teams, but the Detroit Pistons particularly. They're well on their way to establishing records in the worst way. I mean, what do you see is wrong with that team? I, mean, I know they have a young team, but they have a good coach in Monty Williams. Yes, it, you know, um, there are so many things that go into building a young team. And and the problem is uh, you can have a really good coach come in, but that really good coach can't microwave everything. Uh, and a lot of times you can have young teams that, as Jerry Krause used to say, you can have high-priced young players who haven't found their way, and that uh, that can be the recipe for a 50 caliber asshole. And, and so you don't know. The, these are players searching for their identities. Uh, they're well-paid. They've been drafted high. They have reputations. Uh, you know, that's why Phil Jackson – got so much into mindfulness and meditation. He wanted to find ways to ease the pressure, not only on the superstars, but on the role players and the younger players as they dealt with the pressures of NBA stardom. Now, you and I, we're regular folks out here trying to make a living. We, we deal with pressures all the time. All over the world, people are trying to feed their families and do all kinds of things. And so, in one sense, we don't have a whole lot of empathy for young millionaires sorting out their pressures. But as sports fans, we have an intense interest in watching the progress of young talent. Uh, for example, we started out talking about Chet Holmgren, and there was a young talent, you know, very full of promise, injured right away. And so I don't care how much they pay you. I don't care where you're drafted. That doesn't mean you're free from immense challenges and pressures as a young NBA star. 
And that's the name of the game. True, true. How about James Harden, sir? I mean, he's on his the last year of his contract, and well, I don't know how to assess his performance with the Clippers. I mean, what, what what's your take on the fit now after well, they already won some games. You know, I've just never been a big James Harden fan. I, I I haven't I wasn't a fan of the style they were playing in Houston. It really didn't translate to into all of his other travels, uh, and thus it's no surprise to me that it's not translating here. They're making the effort. The Clippers have a a good group. Uh, they have a solid group. Um, I think they will maybe find a way, but James Harden's under some pressure. He's late in his career. He, it costs a lot of money. He's trying to go around and find places that, that would still want him and pay a lot for him. And, uh, you know, as he goes along, he's stacked up, you know, accolades and scoring averages, but he hasn't gotten the kind of success that leads to long-term adulation. And so um, he's got his own set of pressures to deal with. Do you see him possibly following, I mean, the path of uh, Carmelo Anthony and Allen Iverson? Well, yes and no. Uh, those players accomplished certain things along the way. They, you know, Allen Iverson and Carmelo Anthony, they had a certain level of power, but they really weren't flexing the kind of power that this current generation has. These superstars, they're making so much money, they can really sort of throw their weight around and make demands and... Um, you know, back when the back in earlier decades in pro basketball, when the executives, when the owners had all the power, there there were always failures. People who did not read the NBA landscape well, who did not make smart decisions. And I don't think that's any different now that players have their power. Some of them are going to do really well with that power. They're going to learn how to use it and without overusing it or abusing it, and they'll prosper. Other players never quite pick up on that. They're just used to using the power. It is a function of what they do. And, you know, power can be really good and it can be really bad. It usually involves the extremes, though. There's not a lot of power that just sort of sits there in the middle of things. Hey, sir. Uh, last for the NBA. The Phoenix Suns, I mean, so far, they haven't really played their three big stars, Durant, Booker, and, Bra and Beal. Now, Beal is out, and now Booker is out again, meaning Durant will have to, well, carry the team again. What do you think uh, is going on with Phoenix, and what are their chances now with all these health struggles? Well, you know, I think you have to get healthy. They have a core. And um, the, the problem with injuries is that you don't get time together because they obviously have uh, a new core and new players uh, as well. And so they're going to have to get healthy and get into February and start to see things prosper with what they're doing. They're going to have to get time together. And so they're also in that wait and see category. Which of these teams, it's it's a little bit of function of in the entirety of the NBA, but it's prominent in the Western Conference. And we're going to see which of these teams can meet the challenges and try to step up and do some things. Hey, sir, I'd like to get into your book now. <laughs> oh, yes, I'd love to do that, obviously. <laughs> okay. Sir, I have to ask you, um, what is there? What what can readers? I mean, well, Magic Johnson alone is interesting, but this book of yours, I'm re me too. I'm it's I'm really interested. What can we expect from this book? 
Well, it's the story of the greatest point guard in NBA history. This guy who came along even as a, a teenager, even as a grade schooler, and he had his own ideas about how the game should be played. And he had a very strong will, and he revolutionized basketball with that strong will. But it's the story of so many things. It's the story of... Um, you know, the merger of, uh, again, great basketball talents, Magic Johnson, this very rah-rah guy who took control of everything, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, this, this, this dominating figure on the NBA landscape who did things one way, and here's Magic who wants to run with all this talent. And so it was fascinating to watch them work out their chemistry and sort of the bargains they made with each other to do that. And so the, the basketball story to me is absolutely fascinating. Then you add in the fact that Magic Johnson was this incredible figure back in Michigan where he grew up and went to college. And he, he comes to the NBA in the age of sexual ac uh, excess. And he is the all-time leader in many ways in sexual excess. Now, that's saying a lot because you're in Hollywood where you have all the movie stars, you have all the athletes in, in baseball and football and all the musicians. And, you know, it's, it's a world of power and sexual uh, excess. But, but suddenly here comes this HIV diagnosis that ends, for the most part, Magic's career. He plays this huge role in the dream team. People don't realize he then had the Magic Johnson traveling all-stars. And it was not big news in America, but he played all over the world and really helped popularize basketball. But the big story really coming out of all that is the financial battle the financial competition between Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. And of course, the news this spring, I had to go on BBC uh, television to talk about Magic becoming a billionaire. Well, that was a huge deal. Magic has worked very hard and very smartly to be a billionaire. He's done amazing things. It is an incredible story. But here's the moment he is getting to be a billionaire, this tremendous landmark for him, here's Michael Jordan. He's now worth $3 billion. And, of course, Michael has done it in a different way. Michael had that fabulous Nike deal that really ignited this economic competition off the court with guys like Magic and other figures. And so he, Michael Jordan has earned these royalties. He's gotten his own brand. He was able to get... Uh, to purchase an NBA team at a bargain discount just before prices exploded for NBA teams. And so he made his money really through a series of very, very fortunate transactions for him. Magic, on the other hand, has had to set up the Magic Johnson Enterprises, and he's bought and sold companies. He came up with the idea that there needed to be nice theaters in black neighborhoods all over America, that proved to be successful. And then he started by, he bought a big insurance company. He's bought all these contracting companies. He is a whirling dervish of a businessman, much like he was a whirling dervish of a point guard. I'm assuming there are a lot of stories there. I mean, that people don't know. I mean, we all just rely on the news on the updates on magic. I'm assuming there are a lot of there in this book. There, there are many, many, many stories. And it is a, it's like the New York Times said of the book, it's like a tapestry for our entire age. Because, uh, you know, race is a very big thing in America. M Magic was this guy who always cared deeply about race. He spent all these efforts, uh, not just creating opportunities for Black people, but trying to heal racial misunderstanding. He did that as a teenager. In high school, it was amazing the things he did. And uh, that's a, a very big and important thing and part of this story. But there are so many things in it, so many basketball stories and, and so many stories uh, about the, the global reach 
and power of American pro basketball players and by players coming from the world to play in the NBA from all over the world. You know, uh, basketball is basically number two to, to soccer or association football, as it's known in, in Europe and other parts of the world. It's soccer here in America. But but the point is, the same thing is, is true with with soccer. You have uh, EuroLeague and all these various leagues and these stars from different continents. And it it's sort of uh, obviously a very big global thing in basketball. You know, when David Stern, the late David Stern was commissioner, they did a lot of things to take American basketball from this second rate sport that was losing lots of money and to identify the fact that it had all this power and charm. Residents of the Philippines have known this forever. And so they, the, this is not a new story for residents of the Philippines. They've been loving basketball for decades and decades. But the rest of the globe has sort of stepped into this, this global story. And so, you know, basketball is a high-scoring game. It's fast. It's end-to-end. -end. It involves a lot of different figures. It has its own sets of drama. And, you know, there are low price successes and there are high priced failures and it all sort of just keeps moving. And the people with the purest hearts, the people who are the purest competitors, the people who are the hardest workers, the people who are the greatest leaders, those are the ones who emerge. And that's what we're all looking for, are those people who go through all of these things and they fight their way to put their vision, their stamp, their power on this game. Okay, sir. You've written a lot of books. You've written about Kobe. You've written about uh, Michael Jordan, the Warriors. Where does this Magic Johnson book rank among what those other books? Well, I spent five years working on it. That's five. I'm 71. I spent five precious years of my life. That was seven days a week. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you the personal effort I put into it. I think there are parts of the Magic Johnson story that are critical to basketball. They're critical to our understanding of ourselves. They're critical to understanding our culture, to understanding basketball. I would say the same about my book, Michael Jordan, The Life, which, by the way, is in 21 languages. My Magic Johnson book is already uh, scheduled for eight languages with more coming every day. It's being published in French right now. It's out in the UK edition. My Michael Jordan book just came out in Portuguese. My Kobe Bryant book, Showboat, is in 12 languages. And so there are so many lessons in the Kobe book. And so I think this is one of uh, our fascinations with these great competitors because they also offer lessons about our own lives. And some people wonder why I write so much detail. You know, I talk about all the many people. The Magic Book is a cast of many, many people who played very interesting roles in the rise of Magic Johnson. And so you, you meet all these people and you met all these different people in my Jordan book and the Kobe book and the tragedy of his family and all the different things he sacrificed to fight his way uh, to the top is really the first pure teenager in the NBA in a lot of ways who who came in, it was a real struggle. He had to battle. He was losing his mind and he found a way finally. He used to tell me, I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to find a way. Yeah, I used to have conversations with him. I, I was able to call him in his hotel room and we'd talk for hours about how he was going to make it. And so these stories, these biographies provide all the context 
And I, I read this and I think about my own life. And I, I write these books because I have readers who are thinking about their own lives. And they are interested. They are interested in these great competitors because that's why we look at uh, great figures, famous figures, and they're all over the place. But we're looking at what values do I share with this person or that person? And, you know, we have to think long and hard about where we give our allegiance as the everyday people we are watching these powerful, very public figures. And so I, I think the evaluation that each person makes, every reader, every fan, every listener, every viewer, and I say every listener, I, the proudest I am in a lot of ways of my Magic Johnson book is the, it's 30 hours of an audio book. And it's, it's read by the absolutely magnificent J.D. Jackson. I am having so much fun listening to him read these stories that I've spent my life trying to put together to figure out all the pieces to the vast puzzle of these very powerful and impressive lives. How many pages does the, this, this, is the book? I mean, the Magic Johnson book. The Magic book in English is 830 pages. That's with all the end notes and things. It, it, that's why it's 30 hours of audiobook. Uh, and that's, but the end notes are part, it's about two, uh, eight, uh, 770 pages. My Jordan book was 730. These are big figures. Uh, but it's all, it's the story of many things. Uh, it's, it's the story of the rise of basketball and how a powerful figure like Magic Johnson can drive the agenda. It's the power of, the competition of the money that that these big competitors are are making, but it, it it's really about the game that we love, and it is where the game that we love is going. And I will say, uh, you know, Magic Johnson's lawyer George Andrews, who was his lawyer for the first eight years, told me, you know, Magic was a lover, not a fighter, and. Obviously, I, I think the thing that uh, marks Magic Johnson, and this is sort of from my conversations with Jerry West years ago, that Magic Johnson had the, perhaps the greatest heart in this history of, game, of a game with very big hearts. But not only that, he from, from a very young age, he totally and completely and thoroughly loved basketball. And he gave just about everything he had to that. And he had a lot. He gave a lot to the game. So is this book available? I mean, is this the book or is there a, or sort of an e-book or the audio book? Is, can these be bought online? Yes, they're available everywhere. There's a... Uh, uh, the the audio book obviously is available first in um, uh, all the American book outlets, but they extend globally. It's now out in the UK edition, which goes all through Asia and all parts of the English speaking world. It's out in French, uh, coming soon in in a, an array of languages. But um, you know, we live in an age when you can pretty much get what you want. I, uh, my personal enjoyment, and I wrote the daggone thing, is that audio book. But the book itself is, um, if you love basketball, it's very much a story of many things, but it really becomes this story of the great love of basketball. Yeah, 